It's strange to think that the frozen wilderness of Antarctica was home to civilization, but it was. The fact is, we still have so much to discover regarding the past, in particular advanced civilizations that existed here in ancient times. It is more than possible that the oldest ruins on Earth are preserved on the Antarctic continent deep beneath the glaciers. As the ice recedes and we advance in satellite technology, we are given an opportunity to peer further and further into this mysterious continent. From time to time, anomalies are thrown up that can only be explained if we consider that a civilization thrived here before it became frozen. Satellite imagery suggests that there is indeed a huge presence of ancient structures under the ice at Antarctica. Wait to hear this. Now the problem that archaeologists, historians, and experts on the arise of human civilization are confronted with is this. The ice sheet at Antarctica has been unchanged in 20,000 years or so, according to their estimates. So 20,000 years ago, a civilization was present here and were capable of building enormous structures, including pyramids. Is Antarctica the cradle of civilization? More and more often, we are hearing of the reports of mysterious structures being spotted at Antarctica, including one recent anomaly that caught the imagination where standing stones, very much like what we see at Stonehenge, was spotted. This raises the hope of expeditions to the region, as these anomalies are currently only visible with satellite technology. As the ice melts away, which it is doing just now, by the way, what may be revealed in the form of ancient structures will rewrite history, question everything we have ever known, and inevitably create a new perspective to the human story where connections to ancient text and mythology generate a clear picture of the journey and timeline of our civilization, it seems this is inevitable. We humans are strange in the sense that we don't know who we are, we don't know where we came from, and indeed we don't know why we are here on Earth. If we were a genetically seeded race, for example, then we have inherited the Earth from a previously more advanced civilization that broke all their toys and left this place before the Great Cataclysm. After this event, the survivors were spread out all over the Earth. Separated by sea, they lost communication with other survivors, forced to more hospitable locations. They were forced back to a near primitive state, but survived their history through storytelling. In 1929, in an Istanbul palace, a map was discovered that tells part of this story. The Peri Reis map unequivocally shows Antarctica before it was covered with ice, leading many to speculate as to how old the map was, where the source maps of this map originated, and above all else, was Antarctica inhabitable at the time the map was created. The map can be dated to 1513 when Captain Perry Reyes plotted this from source maps, possibly from surviving remnants of the Great Library. This was hundreds of years before our culture even knew it was there, leading scholars the world over scrambling for answers. Well, guess what? They can't explain this using the knowledge they possess. Why? Because their education does not allow this to be true. Hence, so-called experts are baffled. The question is, where did Perry Reyes source his knowledge? If this can be found, then perhaps the answers to our lost history may start to unfurl. It's pretty obvious that in so-called prehistoric times that we were much more advanced than our educators themselves could ever have imagined. Let us not shun the truth in favor of ignorance, guys. Mainstream academia are clutching at a history that does not portray an accurate account of human history or indeed of Earth and of lost civilization. You are hard pushed to deny the fact that everything is older and more elaborate than our wildest estimates and with the melting of the glaciers at Antarctica accelerating then the feeling among researchers is that evidence of a far older civilization is just around the corner. Evidence of structures that they will be forced to acknowledge and admit that advancements in technological understanding existed tens of thousands of years before 
we were even meant to be conscious. What if we were to tell you that this is about to be confirmed? That there is in fact sophisticated structures beneath the ice of Antarctica that would change and indeed shock the world, right? A half mile under the ice exists a structure that is set to change history. It would seem that through the use of satellite technology, disclosure is just a few clicks away. This is fast becoming a publicly acknowledged phenomenon. This is indeed the way in which disclosure is manifesting before our very eyes. Perhaps the answers can be found in the work and research of Brian Fwister and indeed the evidence he has gathered as to the path the people of the Americas took to reach this land through sea travel from a far off land. The capability of navigating the sea in ancient times that led them to this place and by the way, they knew where they were going and how to get there. They were able to circumnavigate the planet thousands and thousands of years ago. Our education system has failed us thus far. It's up to us to carry this new torch of knowledge. In school, we are basically taught that these ancient cultures made up the stories to where their ancestors came from. We think not. This is evidence that is presented in its clearest form yet. Through the ages, it has been brushed aside. Well, guess what? It survived with the survivors, and now we all know the score here. Let's do it justice and keep it alive. Is elongation of the skull an effort to recreate the form of the Anunnaki to look like the gods? And are some of these skulls, in fact, remains of these gods? We will discuss this in part two, guys. Time to wake up. Comments below, and as always, thank you for watching. Because we can see this obvious transformation here. However, it's the volume and the fact that there are hundreds of examples of this. There are actually five different kinds, five different styles of elongated skulls here in the Paracas History Museum. That could represent five different social classes. We don't really know. No one studied this since 1928. But what I really want to do, because there are so many people interested in these skulls, is to slowly rotate it for you so that you can stop uh, and freeze frame it if you want at any given time to have a look. The jaw is also much larger than a normal human being. And there seems to be a genetic um, tendency to have fewer teeth, especially molars. In some cases, uh, there are at least four mo uh, molars missing, other cases, eight. And some people have said that that would be the result of a poor diet, which isn't true because the Paracas area was incredibly productive in terms of producing food, both seafood and also land-based agricultural products. And then this, we see, is an example of where trepanation occurred, brain surgery. Again, something seemingly pioneered, excuse me, pioneered by the Paracas and later adopted by people such as the Inca and the Nazca. Hi, this is Brian Forster coming to you from Paracas in Peru. And I want to give you an update as to the recently released DNA results of the Paracas people. Now it's taken us five years uh, since we began this process to actually get the results. It took almost three years to get, or two and a half, to get permission from the Ministry of Culture of Peru, who we worked with very closely, especially with archaeologist Ruben Soto, in order to have the DNA testing approved by the government. A total of 18 skulls was tested, and results came back from 12. The DNA was so badly degraded after 2,000 to 3,000 years that of the 58 samples of 18 skulls, we got results from 12 of the skulls from two different laboratories, one in Canada, the Lakehead University, and another one at UCLA in California. A third lab was also utilized at uh, Santa Cruz, uh, University of California, but they stated that of the, I think, 18 samples they were given, no results were forthcoming. 
we're, we're not sure if that's true or whether the results were so bizarre that they decided to hide them. So, <clears throat> in what I can basically tell you is that um, all Native American people of 100% uh, Native ancestry are supposed to be and were of the haplogroups A, B, C, and D. So this is one of the Paracas elongated skulls. This is one that we believe is natural in shape. And as I turn it, you will see the complexity of the design. You see all that amazing curvature. And basically there's a depression here where the two hemispheres would be. The eye sockets are very large. And the, there is a lack of a sagittal suture here. So the results that we got, um, <clears throat> four of the elongated skulls were of haplogroup B, which relates to uh, the fact that um, there was Native American ancestry involved. But the other ones were not. And uh, the most common haplogroups that showed up were U2E and also H. H1A and H2. If you look at where the most prevalent um, percentage of U2E and the H1s are, it is in between the Black and Caspian Seas, as in the Caucasus Mountains. And so that's very intriguing. Um, what I can also share with you is what I believe was the migrational pattern, because these people like the, some indigenous people of the Caspian area and Black Sea area um, were and are dark red haired and also very light skin and green eyes and this seems to correspond as well with the elongated skulls. So I believe what happened was about 3,000 years ago the uh, ancestors of the Paracas decided to leave the area because they were being invaded by someone and so they traveled south through Iraq and Iran to the Persian Gulf, and there they wound up sailing eastwards and eventually found their way to the coast of Peru. There are different routes they could have used. They could have gone through Hawaii. They also could have gone through New Zealand, but then they wound up at the largest natural bay on the coast of Peru, which is Paracas, and that's where they decided to live because there was basically no one living there. They could live in peace.